and welcome everybody. Anne Hyatt is a best-selling author, executive consultant, speaker, and investor. She's a Silicon Valley veteran with 15 years of experience as the right hand to Jeff Bezos, Marissa Mayer, and Eric Schmidt, and executive chairman at Google, um, excuse me. Anne relocated from Silicon Valley to Europe in 2018 and sits on several boards of directors in the UK. She also consults with CEOs and their leadership teams across the globe on C-suite optimization through leadership retreats and training. She is also a sought-after public speaker and has been on hundreds of stages across five continents. She has published articles and publications such as Harvard Business Review and Fast Company and is a contributing author on CNBC. She has also contributed to articles in the New York Times, Economic Times, the Financial Times, and Forbes. Her first book, Bet on Yourself, was published by HarperCollins in 2021. Please welcome to the stage, Anne Hyatt. Hi, this room is huge. I'm so happy you're here. Um, so I'm Anne Hyatt, and I am really, really happy to be on the South by Southwest stage again. This has been years in the waiting to finally be here again, so thanks for coming to my session. So as introduced, um, my talk today is inspired by my 15-year career in Silicon Valley and then as an executive consultant now based in Europe with clients all over the globe. My talk today is a little bit of best practices and a cautionary tale to help you achieve your greatest goals. So I started my career in tech very unintentionally. I studied international studies in undergrad. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, in fact, in Redmond, Washington, um, during the original dot-com boom. Uh, my very, very first job ever, when I was 16 years old, two weeks after I got my driver's license, was working at a startup of five people um, that was called Musicware. It was a, a music software system, and it was very advanced for the time. So that's how I really got my first start in tech, but I had never intended for that to become my full-time career. I went to the University of Washington and graduated in 2002, just after the dot-com bust. I and all of my classmates did not have any job opportunities waiting for us when we graduated, so I really had to invent a plan B pretty quickly. While I was at university, I worked at the European Union Center, and the director of my program um, asked what I was gonna do after graduation, and I said, I don't, I really don't know. I had sent out my resume to 50, 100 companies and had not got a single call back. And his wife worked in recruiting at Amazon, and that is literally the only reason I ever applied. And that single application changed the course of the rest of my life. After a nine-month interview process, my very first job after graduation was working directly for Jeff Bezos from 2002 through 2005. My journey then took me down to California, originally to do a PhD at Berkeley, and then got recruited to Google, where I worked in the C-suite there for Eric Schmidt for 12 years. Now I've re relocated to Europe, I became a, a founder myself, finally went out in my own entrepreneurial journey, not anticipating that just a year later, after I had uprooted myself from my country, my home, my family, my comfort zone of Google, to start my adventure, that the pandemic would hit. So there's been a lot of bad timing, and incredible luck in my career. And through that combination of terrible timing and having to engineer my own serendipity, I've learned a couple of best practices for some of you who might find yourselves feeling in a similar situation now after the pandemic. So I feel a, a huge responsibility to pay forward to all of you entrepreneurs some of the lessons that I've learned from my super performing CEO mentor bosses. So I know I've been in some very privileged rooms and honestly in irreplicable moments in time. The, the dawn of the internet will never happen again. The creation of e-commerce will never happen again. But there are some best practices that I've learned from these seemingly super performers that I have now translated into a playbook for the rest of us normal people. And so I use my career a little bit as a case study for you because there wasn't anything particularly exceptional about me. I didn't go to an Ivy League school. In fact, at Amazon and Google, I was almost always the only one in the room who hadn't gone to Stanford or MIT. I went to public universities, even for my PhD. Berkeley's a top 10, but it's not Ivy League. And I was often the only woman in the room. And when you feel a little bit like the underdog from the very start, you have to take a very proactive approach to your career. So today I'm going to share with you some of those best practices for engineering your own luck and also give you a word of caution. 
I like to think that um, efficiency is one of my superpowers. What I've done for Jeff Bezos and Eric Schmidt at, at Amazon and Google, and I also do for my CEO clients now, is really around C-suite optimization. You don't have to be the CEO of your own startup or, or corporation, but it can very much apply to entrepreneurs, people who are really putting themselves in the driver's seat of their careers, even within a large traditional organization. So I want to share with you a little bit of um, something I've been obs become obsessed about recently. So from very, very early age, I have been obsessed with these super performers. In fact, I remember when I was, gosh, I couldn't have been even more than like seven years old, I remember um, trading extra chores for more TV time, not for the things that my peers were watching, but so I could stay up late and watch the Olympics or watch Miss America. It did not matter what it was. I was obsessed with people who could be the best in the world at what they do. But what I felt I was lacking was something exceptional about me. My goal, if you had asked me, little, little Anne from Seattle a long time ago, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said Olympian. Your natural next question would have been what sport? I did not have an answer for that. I did not care what sport it was. I just wanted to be the best in the world at something. And um, I thought that I was holding myself back because I was unexceptional. I was smart, but not the smartest. I was athletic, but never won. And it turns out, I've learned over the course of my career, that that in and of itself gave me one of the greatest advantages. Because I promise you, had I had any skills or talents or abilities that were exceptional, I would have rested firmly in that comfort zone. By nature, I'm very timid. I am a perfectionist in all the negative connotations of that word, meaning I would have held myself back from trying something new out of fear of looking stupid in front of people whose opinions I care about or making a costly mistake for my boss or my company. But because of the time when I entered the workforce, when I was working for executives who also did not know what they were doing because they were inventing the future, it nurtured me out of my nature just a bit. So having this lifelong um, obsession with super performers, I have also noticed that happening in nature. We have animals that can do what our superhero movies are about. They can fly, uh, they can regenerate limbs, they can split in half and become two creatures. So when you think about evolution, there's probably more inside of our DNA than we normally tap into. And something I'm really excited about recently is monarch butterflies. So the monarch butterfly, I'm a West Coast girl, most of my life I've lived on the west coast of the United States, and something really magical happens every year in, across the west coast of the US. There's this monarch butterfly migration that happens 3,000 miles north and south. So the, the migration north, they start in the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico, and they make the trek all the way up to the coast of Canada. And that takes two, three, four generations to make that trek. These monarch butterflies live two to six weeks on average, but then something exceptional happens. That fourth or fifth generation is called the Methuselah generation, or the super generation. This super generation, even though their DNA is exactly the same as their predecessors, their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents who had made this trip south, something triggers in them that makes them super performers. There's a, um, a study done in the University of Kansas that saw that this super generation is triggered in the time of the year in the winter when the days are getting colder and shorter and the sun is only 57 degrees up off of the horizon at noon. It triggers the super generation. This generation travels farther, flies faster, has a greater, 20% greater wingspan than their parents or previous generations, and they make the entire 3,000 journey 3,000 mile journey themselves in a single generation. So I became obsessed because I've worked my whole career with super performers who do things that no one before them has ever done. And I thought, how can I channel this idea of the super generation from these monarch butterflies into my work, into the consulting I do for CEOs all around the world? So I started thinking about doing an audit and thinking about how can I reverse engineer these types of results? There's an economic principle called Pareto's Principles. And Pareto is an Italian uh, economist, and he literally one morning was gardening, and he was looking at his 
pea plants, and he noticed that 80% of the production of his pea plants came from only 20% of the plants. And then he noticed this pattern everywhere. Everywhere he looked, he could see that 80% of the property in his small town in Italy was owned by 20% of the, of the families. He saw that 80% of his results in his economic works came from 20% of his efforts. This is now an established economic principle. And when you start looking in your lives, you're gonna see it everywhere. Maybe you have 10 pairs of shoes and you wear the two. You have 100 apps on your phone and you use 10. The 80-20 rule is pretty universal once you start looking around for it. So I thought, what if I could use this 80-20 rule because that 20% output, that creates something that's disproportional to the time you're spending on it. And so I did a little experiment on myself. In November of last year, at the end of 2021, when we're all truly hoping that we can come out the other side of this pandemic situation, put ourselves firmly in the driver's seat of our career again, I set some big goals for myself. And my most important goal, I decided, became, has become my mantra, which is to do less but better. I think we're all a little bit exhausted from the last two years, and I wanted to be sure that all of my efforts were not only highest quality possible, but I was serving in the right areas that mattered to me most. So this started with an exercise of me writing down my individual mission, vision, and value statement. This process took me most of the beginning of 2021 to do, because while it sounds really simple, it's not easy. And so I ended up for many of my clients, it's free on my website, I created a download to walk you through creating a mission, vision, and value statement for yourself. Um, so if you haven't yet done that for yourself, check out my website. I've got a QR code on the last slide of today's talk, so you can just scan that for later. Um, and from that, I, I decided that's what I'm solving for. I wanna show up fully present in my work in my life according to my mission, vision, and values. And I thought to myself, if someone was to look at my calendar or even look at my credit card receipts, could they reverse engineer what my values are? And it was actually pretty sobering. So I did an audit. I did an audit of my time, my resources, and my influence. In my time, I looked at how am I spending my workday, my personal day outside of work, and I, I crossed off. At first, I kept a, a log. I kept a log in 15-minute increments of what, how I was actually spending my time. So I had everything on my calendar of, okay, at 1 p.m., I'm gonna be doing my quarterly um, invoices. Now I'm gonna have a call, I've got a meeting. And then I would keep a log of what actually happened in the day without judgment. Now this, what happens when you're doing an audit is it's kind of like if you go to a dietitian for the first time or a trainer and they're like, just keep a baseline food log. You start to change your behavior already because you don't wanna write down that cookie. Uh, that's kind of what started to happen in my day already. It gave me permission to say no to some things that weren't aligned with what I was trying to accomplish. And most importantly, it freed up some time for me to say yes to some things that I otherwise wouldn't have had the capacity to handle. I started to do that as well in my resources. If I, my personal mission statement that took me almost a year to write is that I want to discover and empower underrepresented entrepreneurs through actionable education and mentorship. And the first word of my mission statement was actually the last that I added in 2021, to discover and empower underrepresented entrepreneurs. Because what I realized was so many of you, even in this room perhaps, haven't yet self-identified as an entrepreneur. Because we've been taught that an entrepreneur is somebody wearing a, like a t-shirt, working in their garage, raising $100 million from a VC firm, that's an entrepreneur. But the truth is, is even if you're an intrapreneur, you can work within your company and you can define for yourself, what are the confines of my job description? What expertise do I wanna be known for? What teams do I wanna lead? What projects do I want to be capable of managing? And you can put yourself more into control of that. So then I looked at my resources and thought, am I showing up for myself in that same way? Am I spending money towards continually educating myself and expanding my expertise? Am I spending money with underrepresented entrepreneurs rather than big box stores? I really wanted to be able to have the receipts to prove that my values were how I lived accordingly in my life. 
And then the third category is your influence. So in this audit, I looked at my influence. And this is kind of my reputation. What causes am I supporting? When you Google my name, what are the associations? And I really wanted to make sure that that was in close association with my mission, vision, and values. And here's where I'm going to add some caution. Please do these exercises, mission, vision, and values, and please do the audit, because there's going to be some incredible insights. But here's my word of warning. I did not expect what came next. I had a little bit of a breakdown. <laughs> so I, it turns out that while um, efficiency and C-suite optimization and getting teams and mission and vision aligned with our outputs, you can take it too far. What I did, the mistake I made, and I hope you don't, is that I optimized too much. I tried to stay in that super generation, super performer place 100% of the time. I was, it basically meant every single thing on my to-do list every day was a heavy lift. Everything on there was so important to me and the way I defined myself and the way I wanted to be showing up in the world that I became paralyzed to make any progress forward. And that was a very weird experience for me. I worked at Amazon from 2002 to 2005 where we had 180 hour weeks. We never left and I didn't burn out. I worked at Google for 12 straight years in the C-suite, originally when it was not yet the dominant search engine, for very, very demanding executives and I did not burn out. And here I am, a solopreneur, getting to dictate how I spend my time and where I show up myself for the very, very first time and I had a complete meltdown. It, it happened. So it was a week in a row, this is early January, every single day between 3 and 4 a.m., I woke up literally thinking I was having a heart attack. I could not fully inflate my lungs, my heart was racing, and I was drenched in sweat by the time I woke up. I messaged a friend of mine, she's a physician in California, I live in Spain now, and because 3 a.m. in Spain is 6 o'clock in California, that was very convenient for me. And so I called her in an absolute panic saying, do I need to call an ambulance? I truly cannot breathe. And she accurately deduced that I was freaking out. It was true. I confirmed that with my doctor after, but she was right. I was freaking out because I had forgotten actually what Pareto's principle is. It's the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 is the ratio that produces super performance, not the result itself. I was solving for the optimized results, and instead I forgot what fuels that output. I was trying to go against the laws of, I was gonna say nature, but I guess laws of economics, and I instead, I was solving for the output and not the ratio. So this is my <laughs> word of caution to you, and this is why I titled the talk, activating the super generation, say no, get more, instead of becoming the super generation, which was the original title. You have to be very choosy when you want to have an output at a certain level when you activate that. And it's going to feel a little bit weird when you start to implement this. So here's what happened next. After my friend diagnosed me as freaking out, I thought, OK, go back to the principles. How do I spend this 80%? I realized if I want to super perform and have these disproportionate if, um, results to my efforts, I have to fuel myself for that. You have to use 80% of your time in preparation for that. So an analogy, because I'm obsessed with the Olympics, I th think of a triple jumper. Have you ever watched this before? You know, they, they do these quick stutter steps. That's, um, actually, they kind of start like this, right? They build up the kinetic energy. They're building themselves up, and then they run, and they do quick, 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 quick steps to get up their speed. And then they do a leap, a leap, and a fly. And when they fly, that's the part that counts, that gets measured. But when they fly, they throw all their limbs forward, both legs, both arms. And do they land on their feet? Never. You don't get a gold medal for landing on your feet. They land on a hip in a sand pit every time. So what we're trying to do, if we don't prepare ourselves and value the, the kind of getting it going, the kinetic energy, the quick steps, and then the flying, is I was just trying to kind of constantly do the leap and land it on my hip over and over again. It doesn't work. So I thought, OK, how do I prime myself for these kind of results? Let's go back to the audit. Let's go back to my time my resources, and my influence. How can I spend my time to prepare myself to perform at the level I want to? So I started giving myself permission to sign up for more classes, more training, more certifications. I started spending my money accordingly to the reputation, the skills, and the experiences I want to have in life. 
And not just that. So my first instinct was, great, let's sign up for like, I'm going to get an online MBA and I'm going to get a, what, like, wrong, no, <laughs> back it down. Again, this is 80%, um, this is lifting us up. So then I started spending my money accordingly and my time. I now have, so I live in Spain and not my, my family. I'm the oldest of seven kids, so staying in touch with every member of my family takes focused effort. It doesn't happen by default. And now on my calendar, I have a trip to see every single one of my siblings this year. Two, both of my brothers are in DC. I just saw my sister here in Texas yesterday. I'm flying from here to Seattle to see my parents. So I'm starting to spend my resources, my time, and my influence according to my values. Additional word of caution. You, your biggest goals are very similar to trying to summit a mountain. Let's say Kilimanjaro. There's a way that um, professional climbers approach a climb that's very analogous to what we're doing. So what they do is they start at base camp, and that I knew. I had heard that. I had heard, like, okay, you go to base camp, you acclimate to the elevation, and then you progress up to the summit. That's how I thought it went, just incrementally up. That is not actually how they do it. Um, it actually, you go to base camp, and then you go to camp one, and then you come right back down. And then you go from base camp to camp one to camp two, and then you go right back down. We're talking that's a 2,000-mile journey. Then you do it again up to camp four and back, and then finally you do 7,000 more feet. Why do climbers do that? Because there's something called the death zone. I was trying to live in the death zone. The death zone is anything over 18,000 feet. Your body can no longer repair, recover, and regain strength. You're no longer oxygenating your blood in the same way. You're not recovering muscle injury. You have to come back down to base camp to recoup and gain your strength and repair in order to summit. So in base camp is where all of my best practices came back. So after my freak out and reprioritizing my calendar and trying to show up according to my mission, vision, and values and realizing that rejuvenate, rejuvenating and re nourishing myself in my mind, my body, my soul, my relationships would empower me to do that, I remembered a couple things I'd learned already earlier in my career. So while I was at Amazon, I had seen this pattern before. When I worked for Jeff Bezos, every single quarter, every single quarter, remember this is 2002, not now when he's the wealthiest, most successful, most powerful person on the planet. Back then, before Amazon was profitable, when the board was literally starting to talk about bringing in a professional CEO because they weren't sure his ideas were gonna pan out the way he thought, even in that time, every single quarter without fail, he took a thinking retreat. He took a week off, went to a hotel, starved himself of all external stimulus. That meant no conversations, no phone, no newspapers, no books, no nothing. And he just spent the first two days getting as bored as possible. Then, once he's as bored as possible, there's part of your brain that wakes up in the back. Innovation happens between the verticals. Creative thought and anticipation and creating something that's never existed before happens between the verticals. And it's not in the moment when you're working on, okay, we're here, we're here with the marketing team or we're here with the engineers. Those moments of connecting the seemingly unconnectable never happened then. He knew he had to step back and away from his usual routines and influences in order to have these moments of clarity and vision. And so the second half of the week, once he had cleared his mind, he filled these blank Moleskine notebooks with the products I see him launching today. 19 years later, I see in the news something I read in his notebook 19 years ago. That kind of vision does not happen accidentally or passively. I also saw this exhibited at Google. How I have to learn this process over and over again, I don't know. Um, but at Google, I saw it. my very first manager there, my first year, uh, three years at Google, was Marissa Meyer, before she went on to become the CEO of Yahoo. Marissa taught me this really important lesson by um, the way she approached a particularly stressful launch cycle for us. Back then, this is 2006, 7, and 8 when I'm working for her. We have mission-critical launches going on. We're not yet the dominant search engine. We've got amazing opportunities of windows that we really have to capitalize on, and we were a young, scrappy team. The year I joined Google in 2006, we doubled in size of the company. So most of the people there were brand new. They did not know how to get things done. Nothing was fully documented. We were really making it up as we went. And she was really worried that she was going to burn out her team. Her most valuable engineers might get so stressed and so overworked that they could not continue. 
So she had a conversation with a particular uh, very talented engineer named Johanna. She went to Johanna and said, I know you have two small children under the age of three, and you've been tasked with this expansion into Bangalore. I don't want to burn you out. How can I help you? So Johanna said, please don't take me off of Bangalore. I know this is really important for my career, and I'm so proud to be working on this. So Marissa said, how can I make this work for you? And she said, you know what would make me not resent my job? If every single day I got bedtime and bath time with my kids. And that was a moment of click for her. And Marissa said, I will become your linebacker. I will personally make sure you are out the door every single day to be home for bedtime and bath time. And then she went to every one of her direct reports and had that same conversation. She had that conversation with one of her engineers where he said, you know what would make me not resent my job? Every Friday night, my friends from college have a soccer match. I don't want to miss that. I feel like I'm always missing that. And so she got this from every one of her direct reports, and she called that finding your rhythm. She knew she was asking us to sprint a marathon, but she could find a way for us to fill ourselves up, to create our own base camps, and know what needs to be in that tent to allow you to rejuvenate, to heal, and to nourish yourself enough to have the strength to do it again tomorrow. I learned this a third time in my career when I was working for Eric Schmidt for nine and a half of the 12 years I was at Google. When I first started with him, he was CEO, and then he transitioned on to being executive chairman. When he transitioned to being executive chairman, I thought that was going to be semi-retirement. That's usually what it meant back then. Uh, so I went to him and I said, I'm going to help you in this transition, and then you know I'm going to move on. And he's like, why are you going to move on? And I was like, well, this is semi-retirement. And he just laughed at me, and he said, you know me better than that. I don't do anything half. But he said, the second you're bored, you should go on, and I'll help you find the next thing. Well, he was right. He really 10 x his output as executive chairman compared to I mean, he was very high functioning as a CEO, obviously, but really he took it to the next level. He did the same exercise we've just talked about. We spent the first full year uh, together, I was his chief of staff, um, with him in this new role as executive chairman, doing what we called a listening tour. So the listening tour was an opportunity for him to decide, since I have never been a full-time chairman before, and Google has never had a full-time chairman before, I don't want to assume I know what they need from me most. So we went around to 50 or so global offices uh, and listened to the employees around the world. We met with uh, policymakers, with community organizers, with universities, uh, with all the creatives, the smartest minds in the world we could, and we just listened for common patterns. Common patterns that we could see coming, we could solve problems, um, solutions for before the problem really had presented itself. That's when we noticed artificial intelligence becoming the next wave before anyone else did. And that taught me a really valuable lesson. It's equally important for us to be listening and observing and giving time for that space between the verticals for innovation. And I'm going to caution you, if you take this on and you try and adopt this, you're going to have a moment of freak out. <laughs> All of my clients who get brave and do the audit of their calendar and start saying no to things, if you've done it right, you're going to create some space. And again, we go back to the 80-20 rule. If you can leave minimum 20% of your calendar open for moments of magic, and in insight, something really special is going to happen. But first, you're going to start freaking out. You're going to feel like you're like, but I'm not as efficient. Because we're used to measuring efficiency based on number of calendar entries that you have, number of meetings you've got, number of flights you're on, number of conferences you're speaking at. And you forget, in fact, I was just um, watching this Netflix uh, documentary on Quincy Jones. And he said in his creative process in writing music, he got it 75% there, and then he left room for the magic. So you're going to try this, and then it's going to feel really weird, just like a client of mine. A client of mine based in California, now he moved headquarters to Miami during the pandemic. But before he moved there, he went to Miami on a vacation, and we had d just done this audit. We had audited his calendar, we'd created the 20% open time, and he decided he needed a vacation to, do, to try out a thinking retreat. 6 a.m. Miami time, which thankfully was afternoon for me in Spain. 6 a.m., I get a panic phone call from him. And he says, what am I supposed to be doing? How am I, he wanted the, like, the checklist of things to do on his first day of his thinking retreat. And I said, remember, you're, you're not supposed to be doing anything. And the reason why everyone freaks out on this first day is because it feels very self-indulgent. It feels like you're doing nothing. But remember that 80% is fueling this 20% of your time that's going to create 80% of your results. That's the ratio we're solving for. So I hope that this gives you permission 
to do an audit for yourself, realign yourself on your mission, vision, and values, and allow some space between the verticals. If I can add a scientific study to back up this, what I've just shared with you in theory, I would encourage you to read the uh, work of Aaliyah Crum. Uh, her first name's Aaliyah for Googling purposes, but she goes by Allie. And Allie Crum has published some incredible studies about this proving scientifically that this is true. So when you feel self-indulgent, you panic. Remember there's data to back it up. So Allie Crum um, conducted two very fam famous studies. The first is the milkshake study, which I recommend you Google and watch after this. But the second is one about hotel workers. So Allie was a Division I athlete. She played hockey. And she was also a spectacularly brilliant person. She's a Stanford professor now. And she was talking with one of her professors about if it would be possible that exercise could have a placebo effect. And she just thought that was such a fascinating idea. They decided to try and connect, conduct a study to see if there can possibly be a placebo effect to a physical act that is supposed to strengthen and shore us up. So she conducted a study, and she, they thought, how can we have people in a very, very physical environment who aren't aware that they're performing very physical tasks. So they went to a hotel in California and they evaluated the hotel workers there, the ones who are cleaning the rooms, changing the sheets, pushing the carts, vacuuming all the rooms, and they surveyed them in the beginning and they said, how many of you think that you're getting the recommended daily exercise allowance by, from the Surgeon General? Like 10% of them said, probably a little bit less. All of them have evaluated themselves very, very low because they thought that what working out looks like was wearing your Lulus and going to the spin class and like this kind of single definition of what exercise looks like. They didn't have time for that. They had young kids. They had busy lives. They had a very demanding job. And they divided this group into two. And they educated half of the group to show them how physically demanding their jobs were. They were spending eight, nine, ten hours getting way more exercise than the average human was. And then the other group, they, it was a control group. They didn't change anything about their behaviors. They didn't educate them about their physical exertion. Then they came back and they measured literally their vitals. They measured their cholesterol levels, their cortisol levels. They did measurements, their weight, their inches. In the group that had been educated that their efforts were far and above the recommended daily exercise, their body chemistry changes. Physiologically, they had changes because of the mindset that they were now in when they were lifting that uh, heavy bag of linens, when they were pushing the vacuums in the carts, when they were changing the bed and breaking out a sweat. They thought, okay, they, they categorized that as physical exercise and they had a physiological change. So in these moments of indulgence, when we're giving ourselves some space and we're allowing ourselves to enrich our minds, our resources, our influence in a way that's according to our values, something as literal as a physiological change can happen in you. So I hope you take that as data proving that this is not self-indulgent and that this is absolutely necessary for you unlocking yourself to become the super generation, super output that you are capable of. So remember, it is not becoming the super generation. We are activating it. We're being very thoughtful about how we can use our resources accordingly. And I want you to especially focus on the saying no, eliminating first the things that no longer are serving you. Perhaps they were an important part of your journey, of your learning, your education, and that might be an opportunity you can give to the next person. You can create an opportunity for someone you're mentoring that will give them an opportunity to grow and stand on a new stage that they've never been on before. But once you've done that, don't fill all of that time. Be very thoughtful about what you replace it with and look for that continued exchange and getting more. So um, I hope that you will take this exercise. This, um, if you scan this QR code, I'll get out of the way. If you scan the QR code, that'll take you to my book's website. And um, there I have the download where you can do your mission, vision, and value statement. And then you can take time to do your own audit to make sure that you are unlocking your super generation and activating yourself to have the impact that you are uniquely capable of. I've saved time for questions. We have about 20 minutes. Um, so I think we're going to switch to the online system. If you haven't already, you can go into the app. And what's it called? Engage, right? Um, click on the Engage button. You'll be able to submit some questions there. But I really hope that what you take away from this is there is something unique in you. You are a super generation, even if no one who looks like you or comes from where you come from has ever done any the thing you're dreaming of doing. 
you can become that 20% bigger wingspan that fly faster, live longer, and produce more, but only if you shore yourself up and you're very, very protective of your base camp and are fueling yourself for that journey before you make those repeated summit attempts. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm hoping, I think magically, um, I'm going to see some questions that you're submitting here. Um, but I really hope that we can continue to connect. It feels so one-sided for me to be standing on a stage and sharing my stories. So I hope, even if it's not now through your questions, although I hope we have some, but please continue to connect with me here through social, LinkedIn, and through my website. And I also um, have a book that gets much more into several of the stories I've just touched upon today. Oh, right. And if anyone's, in, while I'm waiting for the questions to come up, um, my book is actually in the bookstore. It's called Bet on Yourself. And the book is about exactly what we've just scratched the surface on. It's translating the um, best practices of the super performers for us normal people. And I use in that book my career as a case study for where you're able to create opportunities and really engineer your own luck, even if you are in the earliest stages of your career. There's a lot more opportunities that we can create for ourselves than our um, immediately obvious on the surface level. So um, it's been really fun to kind of see the reactions to that. It's also featured on the Audible app under the South by Southwest section. So it's easy if you prefer to listen to it. I, I recorded it myself. So you can have me in your ear doing your morning workout. <laughs> Questions are coming, I'm told. Maybe it takes a little while to populate. No. We haven't seen any. We can do it the old school way. Oh, you have a mic. Go ahead. Yeah, let's do it that way. I'm very happy you asked this question. I'll repeat it. Um, so is it important to be alone for thinking retreats? I'm so glad you asked that. I meant to expand. That is not the only formula. So there's several different ways I've seen to be effective depending on your personality. That was Jeff Bezos' method. Locked away, no stimulus. Honestly, the blandest hotel room he could find, like monotone, no stimulus at all, was how his brain worked best. I've also seen it work really well the opposite. For example, Bill Gates also does quarterly thinking retreats. He goes to his boathouse with two huge, heavy-packed uh, duffel bags full of books in areas of expertise that are outside of his own. So he'll be reading about DNA one day and then about climate change another or about um, a health breakthrough. And so for him, it's about multiple stimulus, giving him a new uh, correlation or inspiration or idea. Another way I've seen it is some of you might be like, okay, that sounds great, but wouldn't it, you know, I don't have the freedom to like leave my children and my job for one week every quarter. There's a way for you to do this um, that's a little bit more approachable. So first you can start your 20% time with whatever is within your, your own control. If you have 10 minutes to yourself, then use this <laughs> on your 10 minutes. So it can literally be inviting a morning meditation or a yoga or a breath, but I think you have a lot more freedom than you think. Once you've decided that this is important to you, go and have a conversation with the stakeholders in your life. The stakeholders in your life are your life partner, your kids, your boss at work, the people who need a little bit of buy-in for you to try something new. And outline for them, here's what success looks like for me. This is what I want to accomplish. This is the bet I'm making, because none of us really know in the beginning what the right formula is going to be. Here's the things I'm going to try and how it might affect you and get a little bit of buy-in. And so even if you have just a few hours, um, using that very purposely can make a huge difference and inspire you of like, actually, maybe I could go to my boss and, and adjust my, my assigned tasks to be more aligned with these values as well. So at Google, famously, you might have heard about this, we have something literally called 20% time. Uh, they give the engineers 20% of their time where they can work on literally anything they want. They can use company resources. You don't need manager approval. Why would they do something so expensive? These engineers' time is very, very valuable. Because they've seen time and time and time again, when you give uh, them the creative freedom to do that, all of the core um, products that we're using today, maps, news, et cetera, were developed during 20% time. So even if it, and, and engineers at Google use it very differently. Some of them save two hours a day to work on a passion project, and some of them save one full day a week or one week a month to do that. So I don't think it's, um, there isn't one size fits all on how to do it, but it's about consistency, I think, and, and consistently showing up for yourself and making it non-negotiable. Because the second you try it, it's going to be hard, and then people are like, 
they inch into your whatever you're protecting. So making it very consistent and non-negotiable, I think, is the most important element, whether that's a few minutes a day or a day a week or a day a month, whatever it might be. So hopefully that's helpful. Second question. I wanted to ask if you have any experience or advice around procrastination. Um, I have, you know, read a lot about optimizing my tasks and, like, I'll prioritize, I'll cut out a million things and I still find myself paralyzed and just, like, hitting my head against a wall that doesn't exist. <laughs> Anything you could say would be appreciated. That is Thank exactly you. how I ended up in the breakdown zone. <laughs> like I, I was procrastinating because everything felt too heavy um, so there's something, um, it was popularized in the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and there's this analogy, if you have, imagine, a, like, this glass, if we have, a um, rocks, pebbles, and sand that we need to fit into this single glass, it cannot expand or contract, and so, um, what you want to do is put in your rocks first, because the, the pebbles fill in the space around it, and the sand fills in all the crevices, so I find when I'm feeling really procrastination is about paralysis, of like not knowing how to get started, feeling so overwhelmed with where even to start. If you can just pick one, maximum two things that are your must do today, those are your rocks. Um, I find it, I can finally like get going because while my to-do list is never finished, none of you sitting here have a finished empty to-do list, but when I just pick the one or two things today and then I have a conversation with those same stakeholders, this is what I have to get done today so that everyone has the same buy-in, somehow I'm able to get unstuck. I also want to acknowledge this like pot to kettle. This is an ongoing like struggle of mine, um, especially as you get more in the zone of really focused in on what you're individually trying to contribute to this world right now, it can feel heavier. So two, it's two sides of one coin. Just pick one or two things that you're going to do today and then make sure the rest of your day is fueling you for that, building you up, preparing you mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever it is that takes from you. Because if you don't fuel first, how can you possibly lift that essential rock? That's what I was doing wrong. I, that's an Sorry, say again. Like the 80% that you said fuels you. Yeah. Exactly. So on a day that feels particularly heavy and you can't get started, flip it and do that 80% first of fueling up your mind, body, soul, whatever it is to give you that like that kind of like triple jump kinetic energy that we need in order to get going. But again, like I'll probably be in this state again tomorrow and have to listen to this talk back to myself. I think I do that a lot, actually. I write a briefing for a client and then I'm like the next day I'm like, I need to read that for myself. I'm doing all the things they're doing. Um, thank you for that question. I think a lot of people struggle with that. I will jump to some of these in a second. Yeah. Building up uh, on this, do you think the new work formulas that the pandemic brought to us, not having to be at the office from nine to five, mm. maybe uh, being able to work from anywhere. Uh, how do you think they affect on the saying no and making time? Such an important question because it's so complicated. So I think there's a lot of advantages because now we do have a little, we have more choice than we did before on how we're spending our time. We don't have the commutes maybe, you're able to be with your pets or your kids or whatever in a different way, but it can also lead to paralysis because there's no, there's no commemoration of the start of the workday and the end of the workday. There's no commute to kind of like decompress. So we have to create those milestones for ourselves. So there's incredible opportunity here to fill that space that used to be in a commute with the 80% that's going to fuel you, nourish you, inspire you, and build you up. So I think it's about being very purposeful in structure. And I really encourage you, if you're... Um, if you're an individual contributor, have that conversation with your manager. Here's my lines. I'm going to be working from here to here. You might notice like I'm. It's a hard. Uh, I need to refuel during lunchtime or whatever that whatever your rhythm is. Have that conversation so that everyone's on the same page and defining it the same way. Um, I also think it, it, it's okay if it's hard. It's, we're changing habits and we're teaching people to think of us and treat us differently. That transition takes time. I remember early in um, my tenure at Google, I was talking to Marissa about some things I wanted to change. I had some ideas, and I was kind of voicing my, uh, my ideas in a room where it was not really my job to be doing. And at first, it was met with like very awkward silence. So I want to acknowledge that sometimes when we're trying to do this, especially if it's very meaningful change, people don't know how to react to you at first. It might be a little awkward, it might be weird, but when you're defining for them, this is what success looks like, and this is the steps I'm going to do, then you kind of teach them how to treat you a little bit differently. Um, what's the name of this CEO of Whole Foods Market? John Mullally? Mal Mackey? 
Anyway, you know who I'm talking about. He calls it the win-win-win. So win-win-win is I know what I want to, what expertise I want to learn, the reputation I want to be um, building for myself in this stage of my career. You go to your manager and you look for what does she need that's in line with that? What can she delegate down to me? What can I take off her plate that gives me an opportunity to learn that and frees her up to contribute at an even higher level so that she can contribute in a way that's lined with how the company as a whole wins? That's a win-win-win because you get a yes every time. Every time you know what you want and you're freeing up your manager to contribute in a better way so that the company accomplishes their bigger goal, you're not going to get a no. But you might get an awkward silence at first until they do that whole thought process with you, but I found that works for me every time. I hope that that, I feel like that was kind of a, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thumbs up on that. Okay, I'm going to take a couple questions here. Um, Jamal asks, but how do you say no, especially to others in leadership when you work at a company with a never-ending list of PO priorities? This is a little bit of what I just described. So when you're given, <laughs> actually, this is literally something I did when I was working for Eric, especially in the transition from CEO to executive chairman, he let go of every single person who reported directly to him, except for me. So we had a team of, I don't remember, 14 people, and suddenly I was last man standing. They all got reassigned to other projects, and it was just me, but the rest of the world didn't know that we were in transition. So there's so much going on that I kind of felt set up to fail. So I had a conversation with him, and I wrote down, I created a huge spreadsheet of absolutely everything that was on the to-do list, and I prioritized it. I color-coded it with, like, this feels like mission critical, must do today. And um, so we had, it was a shared doc, so he could be seeing at any time how I was prioritizing our output. And then as new things would come on, I would say to him, this sounds really, really important. And instead of just doing my old habits, which was, I guess that means I'm staying up until 3 a.m. today, I would say, so I'm going to move item number four off of that, or I'm going to delegate it to Brian, or I'm going to reprioritize that for next week. And that got me permission to change the prioritization of something I'd previously committed to, hopefully creating opportunities for me to delegate and give it to someone else. And worst case scenario, we all came onto the same agreement that that was moving off. So Jamal, I hope that's helpful in um, being able to have really open conversations. If you have a manager that's unreasonable when you're describing that, um, might be time to start looking around for somebody that a little bit more um, supportive environment, or at least maybe creating um, some cross-collaboration among your peers so that you can ebb and flow with the different workflows um, across the whole group instead of just feeling it. you have to shoulder that alone. I hope it's helpful. Uh, second question online, what are some ways to identify what isn't serving you, but you feel obligated, that you feel obligated to do it? This is really hard for me. So here's, this, this is a daily struggle for me, this next example. So I get a lot of requests. For example, uh, I was in Houston just a couple days ago. I spoke at Rice University. Incredible students, amazing ideas. Really, a lot of them have made a lot of progress in things that I, at their age, I wouldn't even, hadn't even dreamed of yet, let alone started. And so many of them come to me and ask um, if I can help mentor them, if I can just have a quick coffee, a quick conversation. I want to say yes to every single one of them, because that's according to my mission, vision, and values, right? I am there to discover and empower underrepresented entrepreneurs, value aligned. But can I possibly say yes to the volume of people asking for my time? Crushingly not. I mean, I feel every time I, I say, I'm really sorry, I can't. So that's honestly why I wrote my first book. That is honestly why I come to speak at conferences like this, because I can do one to many instead of just one to one, which was my past business model. So finding ways to contribute in a way that doesn't cripple you, because we can't serve anyone if we burned ourselves out, I think is the most important part. Easier said than done, it still crushes my soul every time I have to say, here's my website, here's my book, here's some free resources. That's why I create the free downloads, so I can help as many people as possible, but I don't want to pretend that that's not really, really hard. So I hope that's helpful, Lainey. Any other live questions? Um, we only have 10 minutes left. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and rapid fire. What's the most common weakness or feelings you see among high performers you've worked with? It's, I, honestly, I get more often I'm asked the question, what's the common denominators? So I, I actually really like this. So I would say um, a common weakness or failing among those that I don't think reach their full potential is not delegating enough. And this can be really, really hard, especially if you're a scale-up scale up founder 
um, because you've gone from a really small scrappy team and you knew what everyone was working on. You knew absolutely every detail of every deal and every decision being made. And that here's two things, if I was just gonna give you two, is one, document your decision making. Document your culture and your values so that your teammates, all of your direct reports and your employees know exactly how to make the decisions you would make when you're not in the room. I see a common mistake I see is not doing that early enough. You want to still be the one in every room. You want to be the decision maker, and you don't let go of that soon enough. So um, that's number one, is really documenting your prioritization. And that's about setting that North Star, clear OKRs, or whatever your goal setting system is with them, direction from the top. Number two, honestly, I think this is the hardest one, is when you're scaling and growing. This is when you're having like so much success. Things are going really, really well and you've got your young scrappy team, the people who bet on you when you were in a garage and it was five people and you hired smart, ambitious, you know, passion aligned people, and then you grow at this uh, hockey stick rate and the people that you brought on cannot be expected to grow in, in connection with that. So you've got people who are run, like doing amazing things, but your, your growth is much higher than that. So the mistake I see happening often is not having that conversation early enough with early stage employees. What you want to do is say, we are growing really, really fast. What I want to do is I want to hire someone who can mentor you, who's seen this before, and set you up for success. I'm going to give you this person who's going to open doors for you, sponsor you, enable you to be really effective here. Or you might have people that are just incredible in that early stage, and now they're on the wrong bus. They're incredible being the jack of all trades, balance it, you know, spinning all the plates, but they're not the specialist you need. When you get to a, a startup, you need generalists, scrappy, ambitious, hardworking people who are self-starters. And then as a scale-up, you really need specialists. You need people who are, will wear all the hats and are, are willing to do everything, but are so specialized that they can handle that growth curve. And so hand, um, having the conversation much earlier than you think, hiring the, those specialists before you think you need them so that you can set them up for success is a second thing I see not enough CEOs doing early enough. I hope that's helpful, Darius. Um, what are the top productivity hacks you experienced from your former bosses? Okay. They are amazing delegators, number one. Two, they are unapologetic about saying no. That, I think, I was consistently amazed about they just decided I cannot say yes to everyone, I can't be everyone, everything to everyone, and so they just made their peace with saying no to a lot of things. In fact, um, Eric once, <laughs> I dropped my business card when we were at a conference once, and Eric picked it up, and he laughed when he was giving it back to me, and he said, oh, I thought your job title was say no for a living and make people feel good about it. So that was the majority of what I did for him was say no to people, and that didn't meant they were important to us, that meant I just got them to the right person. He wasn't the one to do that for them, but I could open that door, make that introduction, and make them feel good about it. That's the true art of that. Um, so that's number one, delegate really well, uh, get very comfortable saying no. And third is, and I think most importantly, um, most founders, most entrepreneurs think about the what and the how the most in your business plan. That's most of what they teach in business school, most of what you're focused on. But I think the third element that doesn't get enough attention is the who. So I think that honestly is a productivity hack. If you have people that you can trust with ambiguous problems to solve and just hire really, really well and then get out of their way is the greatest productivity hack I've ever seen. Um, and honestly, people ask me all the time, what do I miss most about Google? And it's not the perks, it's not you know all the things, uh, the free food, I do miss the free food a lot, but it's not that, it's the people. It's the team that I knew fully. I had a team of experts at my fingertips that I could delegate things to, and now when I'm wearing all the hats and doing a terrible job with invoicing, I can only yell at myself. It's very inefficient. Um, so <laughs> I hire really, really well, I think is ironically a productivity hack. Um, as a leader with employees that are burnt out but can't describe what they need or want, what are some tips to help get them on the right path to the 80-20 role? Love this question, thank you. Um, I would have this conversation with them. I would say, as the leader of this team or, or this entire company, this is what we're solving for. So first, give them, everyone, the same definition of success. Not enough uh, leaders take the time to do this, especially if you're mid-manager. What you are is an essential connector between this North Star of your company and your individual contributors. Help them see, especially in the time when we're all feeling very, very overwhelmed and no, no, don't know how to get started, help them identify what is that rock today. Because what happened in the pandemic is employees started moving sand 
in this analogy. The rocks are what absolutely must be done and has to fit in that jar no matter what. The pebbles can settle in with the time you have left, and then the sand is like nice to have. It's all those stuff on your to-do list that never goes away. What happened in the pandemic is too many employees did not know what the North Star was anymore. They couldn't accurately identify the rock, or they didn't feel like they had permission to just move a rock today. They felt like my manager needs to see my name in her inbox 100 times a day. I'm here, I'm working hard, I'm here, here's another one for me, here's another deliverable, and it's just sand. It's not moving the needle forward. So if you're the leader and you have employees that are burnt out, it's because they're moving a lot of sand and feeling undervalued, underutilized, and exhausted. If you empower them and say, this is the one thing I need from you, this is the way, this is why I hired you, or this is how you help the team move forward, or this is how we're successful together, and I just need this from you. You give them permission to not fill up your inbox with sand and to be heads down, to be thoughtful about how they're contributing and move the team forward in a much more significant way by delivering that one thing for you. So first, define it, what success looks like, and second, give them permission in this space to contribute at a deep level, and you're gonna get a whole nother gear out of these employees that currently feel burnt out. Ironically, feeling underutilized is much more associated with burnout than being overworked. If you feel like you're in your zone of genius and you are living your best self and the whole team needs you, that's why in my early career when I was working 18 hour days, I didn't burn out because I felt really aligned, utilized, I was learning a lot from my job and um, that, that felt really enriching. I felt like my job was giving as much to me as I was giving to it and that was a decidedly high bar. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, your story resonates with me so much. Thank you. Thank you. As a director, not C-suite, um, how can one say no to the ass and not feel like you're letting others down? <sighs> you and me both. I, this is hard. This is just hard. Um, but I think in that con what I just described with having a, a single definition of what success looks like and really getting the buy-in from everyone around you. This is about managing expectations up to your manager, across to your peers, and down to your direct reports. will give you permission because I feel like um, letting it down is really around those pebbles and sand level tasks. Um, so I think if everyone has the same definition of success and we've got some buy-in, we, we all know where we're going, I feel less guilt. I still feel bad that I can't mentor all of those, every single one of those students at Rice University who just asked me a few days ago, so it's hard. Easy, but not, simple, but not easy. You know. okay. <laughs> I like this question. Who is the coolest CEO you've ever worked with? <laughs> uh, there, I don't know. Somebody, a reporter, just a couple weeks ago, asked me which of the three would win an arm wrestling competition. Someone had also, I'd never been asked that before. Um, so cool is they're very different. So I worked for Jeff Bezos uh, 15 years ago is when I left. So I knew the 1.0 version of Jeff. Um, he was not yet the space cowboy billionaire that he is today. He was very much tucking in his t-shirt and his jeans, kind of like 1.0. It was still very cool. Like he was working on really insanely cool projects. Um, I, I think it's apples and oranges, honestly. So here's how I'm going to answer that question. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to I'm going to tell you my favorite parts of each of them. From Jeff, I learned to keep your hiring standards very very high. When I was working for him, I um, was moving on to do a PhD and we hadn't yet hired my replacement and I couldn't change the start date of grad school. I was super nervous. So I asked him, please Jeff, reconsider some of these candidates you rejected. And he, I will never forget this conversation, he just put his uh, notebook down and he said, I will only hire people I have to hold back, not push forward. And I have used that hiring standard ever since. Ever since I thought, and the energy exchange as a manager is so is like night and day. If you hire a smart person that is going to come to you with a million ideas and you spend all your energy funneling that into the right direction, that energy exchange is totally different than pushing them into delivering the right things. So that's what I learned from Jeff, which I think is pretty cool. The second thing from Marissa, I learned about finding your rhythm with your team for yourself and for your employees. Key, and I have to give myself that lesson over and over again. And from Eric Schmidt, one of my favorite things, and I worked for him for nine and a half years, so I could, we could talk for the next couple hours about this. But one of the things I think, I think is the coolest about him is that he had on his plaque at Google, a plaque that literally said, if at all possible, say yes. 
That is not about overextending yourself. That is about knowing exactly your zone of genius and what you want to learn next and unapologetically going after it, even if that means you're the dumbest person in the room and you trigger your imposter syndrome and you're really nervous about looking dumb in front of all these people. He sought that out. If at all possible, say yes is about seeking out rooms where you're no longer the expert and expanding your areas of interest and expertise, and that honestly is your base camp. That's the 80 that fuels your 20% efforts. And um, that is one of the coolest things I've ever learned from him. We have 30 seconds. Someone's asking me, how on earth did I end up in Spain? Excellent question. <laughs> the short version of that is I married a Spaniard. Um, but actually, it's been really incredible and in a gift I did not expect. It was very much like culture whiplash, going from Silicon Valley let alone you know, the companies I worked at, to small town Spain, where I live a block and a half from the Mediterranean. Do you know that there's literally a correlation between the pace of foot traffic on the sidewalk and the number of patents filed in that city? Truth, I slam into the back of people all the time. <laughs> I'm not used to this pace, so that was the hardest. But I have to tell you in the pandemic, when everyone was doing a reset, I felt you know a year ahead of everyone else and doing this kind of transition into like working from home and balance and stuff. So it's actually been amazing. And most importantly, I feel like I've learned some really essential things about how to translate the best practices of Silicon Valley to different environments, risk tolerances, growth scales, and um, countries. So it's ended up being an incredible gift. That is my time. Thank you so much for coming. Enjoy South by Southwest. It's good to be back. Thank you.